gonna make a change for once in my life. Right now, you sing it too wild. It's gonna feel real good. Gonna make a difference. Gonna make it right. Okay, this is why I shouldn't have let y'all talk me into doing pop songs in church. Now, don't you bring all that Mariah Christina mess up in here. I don't care about hearing you. I want to hear God through you. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat, this wind is blowing my mind. I see the kids in the street with not enough to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their need? A summer's disregard, a broken bottle top, and a one-man soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know, cause they got nowhere to go. That's why I want you to know, I'm starting with the good I um this is not even on my notes but I was listening to a podcast and I was talking about um some really wise dude and I can't remember his name might have been Plato or something said if you want to change the world take hold of the music and I, I do believe that is you know there's a whole sermon in that just listen to the words of the song and I can go yeah we're done walk out anyway <laughs> Not so lucky. So today's going to be fairly informal. I know we've got the kids in here and I thought um, I'm generally teaching extremes in the extreme group. We just sort of throw things around, have question and answer time. So I'm thinking we'll have a bit of audience participation during this sermon. Now, straight away, I, some of you are getting sweaty palms, aren't you? Just start, You just went, oh my goodness, I'm out of here. That's it. So if you're an introvert, 
everything's okay, I'm not going to make you do anything or say anything you don't want to. Mum, it's going to be all right, okay? It's all right, it's okay. All right, so, but there is opportunity. So let's go. Here's, here's audience participation. Hands up if you know what you look like in the mirror. Come on, it's not a hard question. Hands up if you know what you look like. Yeah, 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 looked in the mirror recently. Yeah, excellent, excellent, okay. Um, hands up if you know what the Bible is. No, yeah, okay, um, some of the extremes, I'm a bit worried, I teach you guys, you don't know what the Bible is, obviously not doing a good job, um, hands up if you watched the grand final yesterday, yeah, excellent, that has nothing to do with my sermon, just curious, um, wonderful, so, alright, so today we're going to get stuck into James, the Bible's full of lots of books, I like the little ones, because I feel really good when I finish them, I'm like, yes! finished a whole book of the Bible, five chapters, done, scored. That's just because I like to achieve things, so it suits my nature. So I am stuck in James at the moment, and so you are too. We're going to start James 1.23, and I'm going to find my clicker, and hope, oh, oh, yep, that worked, wonderful. James, but if you don't just listen to God's word, oh, but don't just listen to God's word, You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and then forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Stephen R. Covey, he's the author of um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and he puts it like this and I like this. I grew up with this saying, to learn and not to do is really not to learn. To know and not to do is really not to know. As a teacher I'm amazed how many times, because I teach grade five and six and I whip out this awesome lesson of course and I think, yeah, they've got it. And you know what, the other day I was doing a lesson on fractions and we were doing quarters in particular and, and I got partway through my lesson and I said to a kid, you know, what's a, what's a quarter? And they said, oh, quarters, that's when you get a whole piece and you break it into four even pieces. I'm like, yes, that is correct. You now have knowledge, that's wonderful. And then I thought, because, you know, I'm a fun teacher, I pulled out a Play-Doh and gave them all a lump of Play-Doh and got the kids to make quarters. There were some unusual looking lumps of Play-Doh in my classroom. So they could tell me what a quarter was, but when I gave them the Play-Doh, they had no idea how to make quarters. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that annoying as a teacher? Because they can recite it, but they don't know it until they can do it. That's pretty much the whole point of my talk this morning. If we can talk about something that's only half the journey... I can talk about my God, I can talk about my faith, but I'm only halfway there. To really know something, to truly know something, I have to do something. And that's what James is talking about in chapter 2. We can read the Bible, we can memorise scripture, I know a few of them, but that's only half the journey. Really knowing involves doing what you've read. Ouch. Ouch. James says to read our Bible and not do what it says is as silly as someone who looks at themselves in the mirror and then forgets what they've seen. Okay, another hands up. Hands up if you've read the Bible and not done what it said. Amen, me too, all the time, nearly every day. I was reading back on old notes and I came across some notes from some teaching by Andy, Andy Stanley And he said our greatest goal should not be to know the scriptures. Our greatest goal as teachers shouldn't be teaching what's in the Bible. The problem is not that people don't know enough of the Bible. The problem is Christians don't do what they do know is in the Bible. The problem is Christians don't do what they do know is in the Bible. Spiritual maturity is not about how much of the Bible we know. Spiritual maturity is actually about our friendship with God. 
It's about our closeness with God and it's about how much of the Bible we actually put into practice. You know, I want you to go on this little dream with me for a minute, a little bit of an imagination session. Imagine if all Christians actually loved each other. Blow my mind right there. Imagine if they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul and their mind and loved others like they love them. So imagine if they just learned to love themselves. Imagine if all Christians were patient and kind. Imagine if every workplace where there was a Christian, you could just tell there was something on that place. There was just something infectious about that, the way they did, did their work and related to their colleagues and you know, imagine if every school there was a Christian kid just had that something going on because that kid just loved on the people around them and helped out their classmates and didn't put others down. Imagine that. Imagine if Christians were the most non-judgmental people on earth. Imagine if they didn't keep pointing out the big planks in other people's eyes and actually looked at the little speck in their own. You know what I'm saying, don't you? James 2.14, still in James. James is awesome. He says, dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate a person really has it? For instance, and I love this, I love this. You come across an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and you say, good morning friend, high five, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit and then walk off. All right, audience participation time. Who's praying for who? Or who's talking to who? Who's in this? It's not hard, come on. Someone, to, yeah, but who in particular are they talking to? Who have they, they, they come up to a old friend. This is someone they know. I'm assuming if you've got a friend, you care. So this person's not an unfeeling, unsensitive kind of person. They've actually come up to an old friend. They've come up to someone they care and they've said. You know, so this is not flippant. This is not like this person doesn't care. This person cares. This person is you or me coming up to an old friend. Do you think the person saying this actually believes that God can bless them, that God can fill them with the Holy Spirit? Yeah? I've got one on yes, no, going no. Yes, yes up the back. So this person's genuine. They could be absolutely genuine. But what has it cost the person so far? To say to their friend, be clothed. May you be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's it cost them? Nothing. It's cost them nada. Zilch. The rest of that actually says, be filled with the Holy Spirit and they walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. But where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can't remember if I got that from the message or not, but it sounds like it. Outrageous nonsense. Real faith. You've experienced this, haven't you? Real faith costs you something. It does. Every time. Real faith. When you put your money where your mouth is, costs you something. My clicker doesn't want to work today. Oh, it tends to be uncomfortable, it tends to be inconvenient, and it costs you something. I um, have a couple of examples. Just recent ones, a friend of mine, um, she's got a couple of young kids, she's not working at the moment, and one of her kids is in grade one, and she was having a chat with the teacher of the child, and the teacher shared with her, you know, this is a hard class, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm... I've got so much work here and I can't actually get through it. These kids need more than what I can give them. And, 
And my friend, being a beautiful Christian, said, I'm going to pray for you. And, and she did. She went home because she's gorgeous. And she started praying. She started praying in a solution to this teacher's problem. She prayed in someone who could come in and give their time and effort to that class and, and give that little extra. Now, the funny thing is, my friend is a qualified teacher. Halfway through a prayer, she goes, oh, I'm just the answer to this prayer. I'm actually the answer to my own prayer because I am qualified to go into a classroom and help in the way that they need help. So she went back to the teacher and she said, I will come into this classroom two days a week and help you. That is a difference between... And like when she was praying, she was genuine. She wanted an answer. But real faith costs her something. It costs her two days a week. That prayer cost her two days a week. Real faith is inconvenient. I um, At the previous church I was at, I was in a prayer meeting one day and it, it was just an informal kind of thing. We got together, there was about 10 of us and we were praying and so we asked, you know, who knows the people who have needs and um, one person said, oh, I know this person, I can't even remember what the money was for, but a, f- a person we knew needed $100. And um, can we pray for that? And I just did some quick calculating. There's 10 people in the group, they need $100. And I just thought, well, couldn't we all just give 10 bucks and we don't even need to pray? And so having a big mouth, I suggested this. And some people went, oh, it's a great idea. And some people, you should have seen their faces. Oh, my goodness. God will provide their needs. I don't have to reach into my pocket. What are you thinking of? Real faith sometimes costs us 10 bucks, sometimes costs us more. Because who has to have faith then? If you've just given your last $10, who has to have faith? You do. It's not just a prayer I shoot up and go... Thanks for, thanks for covering that, God, you're awesome. Suddenly I've got to trust God because I might have needed that $10. I might have needed the bread and the milk on the way home and I've got to trust him that he has that covered for me. Now it's real. Now this, now this faith journey has gone duh, duh. Oh, I feel good. This is good. Faith must be paired with action. And um, actually, I might play that video now, Paul. I, um, as I was thinking of how faith is paired with action, I thought of the story of the Good Samaritan because we've been covering this in Sunday school lessons. So I, um, instead of reading it out to you, I just thought Paul can play a video and it covers it pretty easily. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed over. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus answered, yes, now go and do the same. 
So good. So good. So who was the one who really pleased God? Who made God's heart warm? Was it the people who, I know all of this, I know all of this, I know all of this, I'm so good, I'm going to the church, I'm going to help out at church, I'm going to help out at church because I'm on every roster, every roster, I'm so good. No? No? Oh, no, from up the back. Yeah. The, the person you would expect to have helped the most. When, I love how he goes around the tree, he doesn't even stay on the path. He's like, I'm out of here. And there's reasons for that which I won't go into. But So real faith. Real faith is putting it into action. Real faith is sometimes will cost you time, money, effort, patience. Faith is believing. But when we really believe, when we really trust that God loves us, that he is for us, that he has everything we need and that his way and his will is the best for us and we can realise that he has thinking that's above our thinking. When we believe, then our actions must follow. It's then our belief makes that long but short journey from our head to our heart. And the exciting thing is when you do what God wants you to do, paired with your faith and your faith gets bigger. And I know Paul and I have experienced this time and time again. We, this is you kind of got to do this in every area of your life. It's not like I'm just going to I'm just going to pair action with you know every part. Of, it's just step by step. So okay, now we're going to trust God to provide our financial need. And you step out like stepping from the boat onto water, thinking, I, I believe He's got me. I believe he's got me, I believe he's got me, I believe he's got me. And then the next time something comes along, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, he's got me. And each step, we do that in every area of our life and and then time and time again, you know, as as that faith gets bigger and then we, but once you've done it, you believe. You know, I I have no doubt God's God's got things covered in my life because he's been there time and time again. So I don't have, to, um, don't have to push myself in those areas, but there's always new areas. There's always new areas where I have to go, okay, I believe this, I believe this. Ah! Does it make sense? Yeah, you're actually looking at me, so that's pretty good. That's good, you're still awake. All right, so homework. Because <laughs> I'm a teacher. The homework this week is to read your Bible every day. Now, don't get all feisty on me. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just read some of it every day and then consciously spend the day doing what it says. Revolutionary stuff. If you don't know where to start, start in James. It's always good. It's a bit hard hitting, but it'll be okay. So hands up if you would like our world to be a better place. Yeah, wouldn't mind things. Yep, excellent. Well, how about we start with the man or the woman in the mirror? How about we start with us? Just one step at a time. Don't focus on what other people are doing or what they're not doing because the reality is we can't control other people. We'd love to. I try occasionally. Paul doesn't let me though. But I try and then I realise I can't control other people. I can only control this. Me. With God's help, of course. Focus on getting to know God. Read the Bible like it's a personal challenge, like it's exciting, like, like God's going, go on, I dare you, go on, I dare you. I dare you to deal with conflict like the Bible says to you. I dare you to go to the person you've got a problem with, the one you don't want to talk to. I dare you. And he's our biggest fan. I dare you to love yourself and then I dare you to love other people like that. Because I love you. You know, he loves us so much. Half the time we just got to love ourselves. Even just a fraction of that, we'd be halfway there. Read the Bible. Ask God to highlight something and then spend the day doing it. And guess what? I'm going to tell you this now so you don't get a shock. You're going to fail. You're going to stuff it up. You're going to mess it up real good. It's awesome. 
But I can tell you what, God doesn't care. If we do something with the right motives and we are working hard with him, not to get his approval, he already approves of us. If we do that, if we have the right motives in the right heart and we're like, God, I'm going to go after that today. I'm going to go after that don't criticise other people thing. And I only got to two o'clock, but hey, it's better than the other day when I got to nine o'clock. It was better than the other day when I was thinking terrible things about people before I got out of bed. He's cheering you on. He doesn't care if you mess up. He's got that covered. He's got that covered. He's pretty big. God's more impressed with our hearts and our desires to do what he wants in our execution. Now, I've preached to myself, just in case you think I've got it. Most of you who know me know I haven't got it at all, so it's all good. Can we do it, church? Can we change the world just by, yeah, we can. And you'll stuff up and that's cool. But let's work on the man or the woman or the child in the mirror.